Today, we are going to talk about chapter 25 in the smart sales system, which is on business networking, using networking to generate more leads. We're going to go back to some of the core concepts that we've been going through of the smart sales system and talk about how those apply to business networking. I want to talk about how to change your mindset and optimize your mindset to get the most out of networking, how to get out there and do more networking, how to build the best pitch that you can use and improve what you say when you are networking to build better relationships and build more productive relationships, how to work a room. Networking involves getting out and going to events. What you want to do is you want to get the best ROI out of that time. Not only that time that you spend networking, but maybe you might spend money traveling to events or attending events. The key to being a good networker is to get the most return out of investment of your efforts and what you invest. Being able to work a room, if you are networking and you're in a room, of people, the more people you talk to, the, the more return on investment you will get out of that event. We will show you real tips and tactics here today that you can implement regardless of your personality style and type that you can use to meet more people in the rooms and events that you go to. And then we'll wrap up by talking about a sales process that you can take the people through that you meet at networking events. So let's just get started and with some core concepts here. And the first one is, if you recall in other training modules, we always start with trying to understand the prospect. In order to improve our ability to communicate and to make better decisions, it all starts with understanding the prospect that we're trying to sell to. So let's start by trying to understand the other people at events. And by understanding them better, we will improve our ability to communicate better with those individuals. And the first thing to understand about them is that the people that you meet at events, they may or may not be a prospect for you, but they're a prospect for somebody and they are getting sold to a lot. If let's say you go to an afternoon networking event, it's very likely that the person that you meet was called and emailed all throughout the day by other salespeople. So whether or not you are trying to sell to them, this is what the person that you're talking to and meeting is going through. And with that, the worst thing that you could do at a networking event and when you're meeting other people is to sound like a salesperson trying to sell something because they're dealing with that all day. So as soon as they sense that, uh-oh, you're trying to push some something on them or talk to them, their guard will go up and it will be more difficult to build a good relationship of any type with that individual. The other thing to keep in mind, one thing we've talked about before is that humans care about their own stuff the most. We care about our own interests. We care about our job, our own level of income, our own family, our own hobbies. And that's a fairly safe assumption to keep in mind. Instead of trying to get them to care about your stuff first, use that assumption and that awareness to your advantage. And how can you use that to your advantage to build better relationships and to have better conversations? Well, make the conversation all about the other person. If they care about their own stuff, if you make the conversation all about them, then they will be more engaged and find that conversation more interesting. So that's a key tip in terms of being a better networker. Your instinct is when you're networking, you want to tell the people you meet all about you and what you do and your product so that you can maybe generate leads and sell what you sell. That's your natural instinct. Become more aware of the dynamic of what you're dealing with. Fight that natural instinct and make it all about the other person. Resist that desire to talk about you and just focus a hunt as much as you can about the other person. And the way that you get the conversation and the attention on the other person is by asking good questions. The best salesperson is the one that asks the best questions. And as long as you just keep asking questions, what do you do? What do you do before that? And the easiest way to make it about the other person is to ask questions. If you're at an event and you're talking to a contact, they are likely not in buying mode for what you sell. What I mean by this is that I'm not saying that they don't need what you sell or that you can't talk them into buying what you sell, but at the exact time that you meet them at the networking event, they are likely not thinking about, you know, who can I find to provide this particular product or service? Now that's not horrible, but I believe that's a safe assumption to make. And when you keep that assumption in your mind, it can improve how you communicate and how you treat the other person. The way that you might use that awareness is you might hold off on trying to talk them into being interested in what you sell because they you become more aware that they, they're not actively looking for what you sell. So take a slower process that you try to take that person through 
through as you build a relationship and as you communicate with them. And regarding that process, the way to basically think about that is that if you go with your natural instinct to think that, well, this person needs and wants what I sell, then you might try to sell the product. But if you become more aware that the people you meet most likely aren't thinking about buying what you sell at that particular time, the slower process would be, let me just try to start a conversation and try to sell a meeting and getting back together maybe on another day with this person that I meet when networking, as opposed to trying to talk them into what I sell. I'll give you an example on that. So let's say you're networking and you, you sell insurance, right? So you might meet someone and you might know that maybe let's say you say sell flood insurance and you know that people don't have flood insurance and they need this and it will save them money when there's a flood. Well, instead of trying to sell the flood insurance at the networking event, when you meet someone, just try to sell them the next step in terms of talking more, getting to know each other more. And that's in the form of a meeting or conversation on another day, possibly. And maybe that's where you can start to get into more of the details about floods and flood insurance and whatnot. All right, let's move on to the next step here, which is to improve and optimize our mindset when we're networking. And what I want you to do is when you first go out there networking and when you're a salesperson, it's easy to fall into the natural mindset of one of picking fruit. So picking fruit mindset is picture a farmer walking through an orchard and with an empty basket looking at trees with fruit and they're only looking for the fruit that's ready to be picked and they ignore all the other fruit. They pick the fruit that's ready. When they're finished at the end of the day, they look down in their basket and they measure their level of success on how much fruit they collected. Now, that's an understandable mindset to have at certain points when you're selling. But when you're networking, the thing is, is that if the way that might apply to networking is if you go to a networking event, you'll see a lot of people and you're basically looking at all those people and wondering which of these individuals is someone that I can sell my product to. That's the equivalent of looking for fruit that's ready to be picked. And then when you leave the event, you're measuring the level of success of that event, the return on investment of that time uh, based on how many leads you generated. And I believe this is the not the optimum mindset for networking. And you would want to shift to one more of planting seeds versus picking fruit. And the same farmer actually goes through a different process earlier in their harvesting process or farming process, which is a, a process of planting planting seeds. When that far same farmer is planting seeds, they have a totally different mindset. They're not looking at each seed and, and wondering, is this seed going to turn into fruit someday? And I'm only planting the seeds that will have a good chance of turning to fruit. No, they plant way more seeds than they expect to ever have fruit. They plant the seeds. They don't worry too much about the end of the process. And then after they plant the seeds, they then provide water and light and nutrients and fertilizer and whatnot. And they trust the process and then at some point down the road, some of those seeds turn into fruit and then they pick the fruit. And this is the mindset you should have when you're networking is that you should not view the people that you talk to and the people that you can meet as are these people fruit and prospects that I can turn into customers? You should treat them as seeds. And the equivalent of the water and the, the light and the nutrients is basically your, your attention and your investment in them in terms of building a relationship. So don't worry too much about where those relationships can go. When you leave the event, it's not so much about how many leads you generated from that event. It's how many people you met and how many potential relationships did you maybe plant the seed to potentially grow into from that event. The other mindset change is that when you're at a networking event and you're a salesperson and you have a product to sell, you're going to look at the people you see and the, the people you talk to as, is this person maybe a prospect for what I sell? And I want you to shift that mindset and look at people as you're looking more for networking partners instead of prospects and potential customers. This is a good mindset change for two reasons. One is, first of all, if you're wanting to have the best return on investment and sell your product as much as you can, which you of course do, a networking partner will likely lead to more sales than a potential customer, for example, or a potential prospect. A prospect could potentially lead to equaling one customer in most cases. A networking partner, someone who you build a relationship with and exchange leads and referrals with could lead to multiple customers. So it's actually more advantageous for you to find good networking partners than find prospects and customers. 
customers. The other thing is, is that when you are talking to the people you meet at networking events, if you treat them more like potential networking partners, as opposed to prospects, you will look less like a salesperson trying to push a product. And this will help you to build better uh, relationships, have better interactions, and likely probably sell more at the end of the day. And don't get me wrong, you could likely meet good prospects and sell directly to people you meet when networking. But I'll tell you this, if you start those relationships and those conversations more from the angle of, hey, you know, I'm looking to help you with your business and maybe and have a networking relationship. If you start the conversation and relationship in that way, that person may turn out to need what you sell and they will be more open to hearing about what you have to offer if you first treated them like a networking partner. The next mindset change is to operate with the rule of reciprocity. Reciprocity is a social rule that basically if I help you with something, you're more likely to help me in return. Now, this is, it's not an exact one for one, as we know in the world we live in. But if everybody you meet through networking, if you try to help them, a lot of the people that you try to help will want to help you in return. I'll give you an example specific to networking. If you're networking and you meet a lot of people, and if you introduce people from your network, then a lot of the people that you meet and start relationships with will be motivated to introduce you to people in their network. And this is the power of networking in that you not only meet the people that you talk to and could potentially sell to them if they turn out to be prospects, but by meeting people and building relationships, you're getting connected and have getting exposure to all of the people they know. And the way to encourage them to connect you with people they know and expose you to their entire network is by helping them to meet people in your network. So I'll give you an example example of how I apply this in real time at a networking event, when I meet someone and they're telling me about what they do, as they're talking to me, I'm immediately thinking about who can I introduce them to that could either help them or buy from them or be a good fit. And so when I think of someone, I may either tell them right then, hey, I know someone I want to introduce you to and I may give them their information. I also, most likely the best way to facilitate that is to maybe let them know that you want to make an introduction and then to follow up with an email introduction introducing the person you met with the person that you know through an email introduction. So this is a great way to foster the rule of reciprocity. And if you do that over a large number of people, you're going to create this army of people that want to help you in the same way. And just think, I mean, if you connect with someone with a potential customer that buys from them, you that's a great investment in the, the emotional bank account of that other person where they're going to be extremely motivated to help you. And just think if you introduce someone to someone that changes the trajectory of their life. Maybe they get a new job or they get a huge new contract. They will never forget you. And so not only, you know, is that a great way to give back to the world, but if you're thinking about your own self-serving interests, I mean, you know, you, someone's going to love you for the rest of their life and never forget you. All right. So let's talk about getting out there. And this just really means, you know, how can we drive ourselves to get out more often? Because, you know, if you want to be a good networker, you want to get a good return on investment from your networking efforts. It's all about getting out there. And this is important to talk about. We can assume that we're all motivated and we're, uh, we can assume that we're all motivated. And if we think networking can help our sales efforts, we're going to go out there and we're going to network a whole bunch. But the reality is, is that it's easy to make excuses to not net go to networking events. For example, a lot of networking events could be happy hours and after business hours. And it's very easy on your drive home to find excuses to not go, right? You're tired and whatnot. Not, and there can be a little discomfort with going to events and meeting strangers, a little social anxiety. There's a lot of reasons and excuses that you can make to decrease the amount of networking you do. So one way to resist that and to work around that, to increase your drive and motivation and persistence is just to set a quota for yourself. And for example, you could say, hey, I'm going to go try to go to an event per week, one, two events per month, two events per week, whatever that number is, that can be different for you depending on your situation and your schedule. But the key here is to set a rule for yourself. And this is just something to keep in mind. And that's something that when you're driving home and you're thinking, should I go to that event? Should I turn left or should I turn right? If you know, hey, I need to hit my quota this week. I haven't been to an event. That slight rule for yourself can prevent you from turning in the direction of home and staying on the path of getting to the network event. So just let me keep in mind. The next thing is just finding good events to go to or finding events at all to go to. And before I share some
some events with you. I want to point out one thing, which is if we go back to the concept of we're looking for networking partners and not prospects, this is really important when you're figuring out what events to go to. If you are only looking for prospects, it's very important for you to pick events where there will be a concentration of prospects for what you sell. And that's going to be very dependent on the type of event you go to. But we're not looking for prospects. We're looking for networking partners. And with that, it does not matter what type of events we go to because it doesn't really matter the makeup of the individual that we meet. We're trying to get connected with their whole network. So regardless of the kind of job they do or background or whatever, they're going to have a whole different mixture of people that they know that they can introduce us to. So it doesn't matter the type of event. That being the case, here are some ideas to find events in your particular area. So a great place to start is industry associations. Every industry pretty much has associations, that are tied to that. And associations often have some sort of networking events or roles that you could take or whatnot. So that's a great place to start to look for networking opportunities. And I want to point out that in terms of industry, well, there are two different industries that any particular salesperson could consider for networking. First of all, if you sell some sort of product, that product that you sell is likely part of some sort of industry. For example, let's say that you sell piping. Well, there might be some sort of governing body to, that for pipes or piping exchange association, or whatever. So that's a good place for you to go look for events. But let's say that you sell your piping to plumbers, okay? There's a plumbing association and whatnot. So that's a totally different industry. There's the piping industry, then there's the plumbing industry. So regardless of what you sell, there's likely two different industries that you could start to explore looking for networking opportunities. Local news resources, If you, I'm sure if you live in a community, there's some sort of news outlets in your area. They likely have websites. And on those websites, there will likely be events in your area. That's a great place to find stuff going on. Meetup.com is a great place to look for networking opportunities. Alumni associations, if you happen to go to some sort of university or school, there's likely some sort of associations tied to that organization that you could get involved in. And to follow up on the alumni concept, even if you did not go to a school or if for schools that you did not go to, if there are local universities in your area, there's likely some networking opportunities at those, such as they might have a speaker for a particular event. It doesn't matter whether you went to that university or not to go and listen to that speaker. And there's going to be great networking before and after that speaker speaks. So that's an example of one type of networking event at universities. I'm sure there's a whole bunch of other. And then lastly, a great way to network is to get to volunteer for different organizations. And again, there are likely volunteer opportunities in your community and and, you know, these can have nothing to do with what you sell, but these are great networking opportunities. And especially if you can benefit from connecting and building relationships with sort of high caliber people in your community, uh, volunteer organizations are usually a great place to find those because people that are either high income people, those individuals usually have time to volunteer. So they, and some sort of interest in volunteering. So that's a great place to meet those people. Also those, the people at volunteer organizations are usually usually very well connected in the community and other organizations. So great way to give back to your community, also a great way to network. All right, let's move on to talked about getting out there and getting to different events. Now let's focus on improving what you say and how you communicate when you're at events and when you meet people. Now, one of the most common questions that will be asked at any networking event is what do you do? So I'm going to talk a little bit about how to respond to this. Don't worry too much. There's not much you can do to kind of screw this one up. The most three common ways that someone might answer the question of what do you do? They either say they answer with what they sell. I sell engineering software. They answer with who they work for. I work for engineering soft, or they kind of share their function and their role. I'm a software salesperson. So nothing real wrong with any of those very reasonable, most common and whatnot. But my critique of any of those is that it's not real engaging. It doesn't get the momentum of the conversation going anywhere. It might not even tell the other person a whole whole lot. The other person might not understand what you're talking about, really. So, you know, it kind of checks the box of, okay, they asked this, then you asked the same question. Kind of a little boring of a conversation up to this point. But 
let, so let me talk about how to spin that and optimize that. And by the way, with this being the most common question, and it's the question that happens at the very beginning of a networking conversation, if we can improve that one little thing, we can improve ourselves as a networker, right? So let's talk about how to improve that. And it goes back to your sales pitch. So we've talked about what most salespeople do, which is product selling. That's where someone goes out and, hey, this is who I work for. This is what I sell. This is what it does. That's the product selling sales pitch. It's most common. 95% of salespeople do that. If you're a product selling salesperson, that's where you answer the question with, what do you do? I sell this or I work for this company, right? Matches up perfectly. Well, we've been talking about moving you more to a consultative selling person where you talk more about, this is how I help my customers. These are the problems I fix and whatnot. Well, you can use that to answer the question of what do you do? And let me show you what that looks like. If we go back to the building blocks, you could use your value points building block. Someone says, what do you do? Well, what I do is I help small businesses to increase the revenue they generate through their website. So again, we're using that example of selling web design services that we've been using throughout this sales training program, but that's, you would insert basically your benefits there. And you just, that's your explanation of what you do. You could also answer that same question with your pain points. What do you do? Well, a lot of small businesses have challenges with getting more revenue out of their website and converting the customers on their website. I basically, I help to solve those challenges. You could also also answer with your name drop, which is, what do you do? Well, and a quick example of what I do is recently I worked with an accounting firm and helped them to do a complete refresh of their website, improve how they tell their story through their website. So that's an example of a name drop example. Now, I will admit that that might leave the other person not completely understanding what you sell. And that's good. You're creating a little curiosity. After you say any of those, then either you might find a scenario where the other person is curious about, well, how do you do any of that? Right. And they may ask you, okay, well, how do you do that? And then you can progress. And so either they ask you or there's a pregnant pause where they, they're not asking anything. And, and then, so whether they ask you or there's a pregnant pause, then you could continue on to share your product building block, which is, and I basically do that by the company I work for. We provide web design services, do everything from website redesign, graphic design and whatnot. Some ways we're different from other web design companies is we use AI. We've been in business for 30 years, one five awards for web design. So that's your product building block. So as you can see there, that's a much more, not only is it more informative and a better explanation around what you do, but it's more engaging uh, for the other person. And so that's a great way to start a networking conversation. So other things you can talk about networking is, as I mentioned, now right after they ask you, what do you do? And you've talked a little bit about you, as quickly as you can, you wanna get that attention back on them. You wanna be talking more about them. And the best way to do that is to start asking questions. And so here's a new building block for you. These are networking questions. And so how's your day going so far? What do you do? How long have you been doing that? What did you do before? What do you like most about what you do? Is there something that motivated you to get into that type of work? Where are you from? What brought you to this event? Have you found this to be a productive event for you? Are there any other networking events that you recommend? How can I help you to be successful? What does a good prospect look like for you? So that's a brain dump of networking questions questions that you can ask. Not to say you have to ask all of those, not to say that's a complete list, but what those questions do a good job of they do a good job of putting the attention on the other person and get the other person sharing all of their interests, you know, talking about their life, their job, the things they're interested in. And that basically, it's a good emotional bank account deposit by you into them. And that if you talk to people in that way, they will become more motivated to learn about you. Not to say everybody, but if everybody you meet at a networking event, you talk to them in that way, it's going to foster better relationships. You can also ask questions of pain questions, the pain questions building block. Now, we've talked about these before. Now, these are designed more for prospects, right? And as I mentioned, you're looking more for networking partners than prospects. So the first way to use these is you would put sort of something on the front end of these. So these questions are designed to be asking to pro potential prospects. So if you're talking to someone and they're a potential networking partner, you would not want to ask them about the web their website because that's transitioning to, you know, I, 
I've, I'm trying starting to treat you like a prospect. So if you get to a point where you ask your pain questions or current state questions, you would start out with something like, do you happen to have people in your network who are having trouble getting revenue out of their website traffic? So that's asking pain questions or current state questions where it's more framed of not you personally, but you know, do people in your network? Now, th those are good questions to ask after they've asked you maybe what is a good prospect look like for you? Well, a good prospect for me, let me ask you, I mean, do you have people that you know that might be needing to convert more visitors on their website? But the point here is that those are a bunch of questions that you can ask when you're networking. The networking questions, pain questions, or current state questions. All right, so let's talk about how to work a room. When you go to a networking event, it's going to be usually a room or some sort of event filled with a lot of different people. And in order, to, like I mentioned, in order to get the best return out of investment for going to that is basically you want to talk to as many people as you can. That's the ultimate goal. Talk to as many people as you can that you do not already know. And in order to talk to as many people as you can, you need to get into as many conversations as you can. And so here are some tips, and some of these may be kind of shocking and counterintuitive. When you see a potential event to go to, one of the first things you may think of is, oh, geez, who can I get to go with me to that? That is the exact opposite thing for you to think about. I recommend go to to events alone, if possible. I say if possible because you may be forced, depending on your territory and the company you work for, you may have to go with your boss or colleagues or whatnot. I recommend go to events alone. Even you maybe shake, get rid of somebody that you know might want to go with to the event with you if you have to. But the reason why I recommend going to events alone is you will get into more conversations, no ifs, ands, or buts if you go to an event alone. Let me tell you why. There are two reasons why why you will get into more conversations if you go to an event alone. First of all, if you go to an event alone, you will be forced to start talking to somebody. I mean, you may spend some time not talking and being alone, but at the end of the day, you're going to be force yourself to talk to more people. Even if being alone doesn't motivate you to start more conversations, here's another way to look at it. If you go to an event with other people that you already know, you are going to talk to those other people a lot. Right when you get to the event, you're going to start chit-chatting with the person that you already work with and that you already know. So right there, there is more time spent talking to people you already know. That's going to decrease your ROI. Another key thing here is that if you if you go with someone you know and you're talking to the person you already know, people are going to be less likely to walk up and start conversations with you. So even if you have trouble and difficulty starting conversations with other people that you don't know, if you're talking to people you already know, people won't start talking to you. If you're standing alone, more people will start conversations with you. So the key thing there is if you go alone, you will get into more conversations. You will have a better ROI. And it's counterintuitive because you think if I go alone, I'm going to look like a loser or it's going to be some sort of negative thing on me. Not at all. You will get more out of the event if you go alone. The other thing that's counterintuitive is I'm going to tell you to go to the event at exactly the time the event starts. So your natural instinct is, okay, the event starts at six. I'm going to go about 630 because I don't want to be the first person to walk in. I don't want to look like a loser that thinking that you're the first person there is going to make you look in a negative way. So when you go fashionably late, then you're going to arrive at the event where there's other people there. They're already in conversations and it's going to make it more difficult to talk to the people that are already talking to someone else. When you go when the event starts, if you really follow this, you may be the first person to walk in. And that is a great great scenario for the ROI and getting into new conversations for a couple reasons. First of all, when you walk in, you're the first person there. Everybody that walks in after you, you are at a higher value social status to those other people. It's kind of like being a sophomore and it's the freshmen that come in behind you, you look like a sophomore. So you're already at a more senior level and that is good for you. It's also easier to talk to those people that as they arrive, because they're not talk talking to anyone yet. So it's real easy to start conversations at the beginning of the event. The other thing that, that you can do when the event starts is maybe you're the first person there. You could actually talk to the organizers and the hosts of the event. Those are great people to meet. Not only are those good connections that you can make, 
like. And those great people to add to your network if they're the hosts and organizers of a networking event. But when other people at the event, maybe people that arrive after you, see you interacting and talking to the hosts of the event, again, it's going to raise your social value level. It'll raise your social status at that event. You not only go from the sophomore, you go to the senior level for the people that arrive that are just at the freshman level of social status. All right. So when you first get to an event, depending on your personality style, really, even if you're an extrovert, you might feel a little bit of anxiousness and discomfort with walking up and talking to people. So a great way to warm up is to go, you're going to see most likely people standing alone on the side, not talking to anyone. Those are great people to warm up your networking skills and get into a networking gear with. Go walk up to them, introduce yourself. That's a great way to warm up. Not only is there should there be less intimidation there, and it's easy to talk to them because they're not already in a conversation, but usually will be pretty friendly to you because you're kind of saving them. They may feel discomfort because they're standing there alone and you're saving them. So they might be really warm and easy to talk to. So that's a great way to warm up. But once you get beyond that, another way to get into new conversations is to post up, meaning kind of hang around high traffic areas. So high traffic traffic areas could be like the entrance or the registration stand or the bar, coffee, refreshments area. So to give you an example of how this might be applied, let's say you stand in line at the bar and regardless of what you're drinking, could be water, coffee, whatever, could be an alcoholic beverage, you get your beverage. And then instead of walking ways away, kind of hang out near the bar and sip your drink, whatever you're drinking. And then as people come to that same area and get their drink, and then they start to walk away, that's a real easy way to kind of, you know, make eye contact and nod and say, hey, how you doing? As people are slowly walking away from that high traffic area, it's just an additional way to get in a conversation when you're alone, right? Because if you follow my advice of going alone, you know, if you're alone, you need some tactics here to get into conversations. And that's a great way to do it. This other one is actually going to be counterintuitive to your natural instinct as well. And this is to join a table of strangers. This could be applied. Let's Think about maybe an event that has some sort of food refreshments. Uh, if there's food and and tr and snacks and whatnot, maybe it could be a formal meal. There's going to be tables where people sit down to eat. And your natural instinct, let's say you, you there's people you've already met, or maybe you, there are colleagues of yours at the event. Your natural instinct is let me find people that I already know and go sit with the people I know, right? I mean that's like think of it that that's what you would do in when you were in school, and that's your natural instinct, and that's what you will try to do at a networking event. That's the worst thing you can do. Even if you know people at the event, go try to find a table of strangers and sit down with them. You might think that's inappropriate. They Maybe the people that the strangers know each other, you're um, barging in on their conversation. It, at a networking event, that social norm does not apply. That may apply in high school you know, or uh, school, but you don't need to worry about that here. If you see an empty chair, and one way you can, if you really want to be polite, you see an empty chair and maybe some people are at a table, you can ask, is anyone sitting here? If there was any sort of problem, they would either let you know that someone's sitting there or whatnot. Maybe they may even let you know this is an internal business uh, conversation, but that's extremely not likely to happen. So, you know, you say, is someone sitting here? They say, no, you sit down. And then most likely they will invite you into the existing conversation. You know, what do you do? What brought you here? What not? And if they don't, then, you know, someone on either side of you and say, you know, say, hey, how you doing? What brought you here? Or, you know, how's everything going for you? Whatever. And you start a conversation. Not only is this a great way to meet people at the event, but it's kind of like you kind of have a great audience of people, meaning everybody at the table is going to kind of be there for a few minutes. So it's a great audience and a great way to meet people. The next tip is to don't judge a book by its cover when you're networking. It's real easy for you to see people at an event, you know, look them up and down, make some sort of assumption based on their appearance, and then make a determination if this is someone I want to talk to or not. And I would say, ignore all of that, that I just talked went through right there. Don't judge a book by its cover. This is important for two reasons. One is you never know what's going on with that individual. You know, they may look like they're, you know, not in the social status, the people people you want to interact with are, or that they don't have income that someone might need to buy your product. First of all, you never know what's going on with someone. So don't judge a book by its cover. Talk to as many people as you can. The other reason why you should apply this is that remember, we are not looking for prospects. We are looking for networking partners. So even if you were to use a stereotype and you look at someone and you say, my customers are in this sort of income bracket, and that person does not look like this level of income, it doesn't matter. Even if you you are 
completely correct in your assumption, you're not looking for them to be a prospect. You're looking for them to be a networking partner. And it could be the case that if they're not in the income bracket, then they likely don't associate with people that are in your income bracket that are in the appropriate income bracket that I could see you making that assumption. But then again, don't judge a book by its cover. You don't know who they know. So try to talk to as many people as you can. Now, of course, if you talk to someone, you don't want to invest all this time in them after you start to learn more about them. And maybe they what they say to you, you can disqualify them from being a prospect and a potential networking partner. And then you slowly sort of talk to them for a few minutes, then you get out of the conversation. But before you learn that, don't make any judgments. The next key to getting into conversations is that at some point, you're going to need to break into existing conversations. If you just talk to the people that are standing alone, or the people that are, you know, getting coffee, you're only going to meet so many people at the event. And remember, our goal is to maximize the return on investment for our networking, you're going to need to get into existing conversations in order to meet a lot of the people at the event. This can be difficult for regardless of whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, you see people talk you're going to feel like you're intruding, interrupting something. So what I'm going to give you is I'm actually going to give you a break into conversations process. Now, this may seem like complete overkill and that I'm getting into too much detail here and and that you don't need to do all this. Maybe some of this process gives you ideas of how to work the room and how to talk to more people. And you could take from this maybe small stuff, but this is a thorough process of how to see people talking that appear to be in an existing conversation and how to interrupt that. So the first step is to basically approach the edge of the circle. So if you picture three or four people sitting there talking, standing there talking, whatever, go and approach the edge of the group, right? So you're not just barging and getting right, you know, right there. You're just kind of softly approaching the edge of the group. And 50% of the time, as you approach the group and you're just on the outside, 50% of the time, the group will engage with you. And so someone in the group may say, oh, hey, how you doing? Or what do you do? Or, you know, invite you into the group. And that's great. Your goal was to break into the conversation. And if this happens, which it happens 50% of the time, your job is done. You don't need to worry about any of these other steps here. And so 50% of the time, you're good from here and you move on. 50% of the time that might not happen where you approach the edge of the circle and they just keep talking and they might keep talking. Most likely if they keep talking, it's because they're just not aware of what's going on around them and they don't know how to invite you in or, you know, it's just a lack of awareness. And then sometimes they might keep talking because it's a private conversation and, you know, they don't want you to be a part of it. But if they keep talking, and by the way, you only wait like a few seconds for them to invite you in. So you're, you're hanging out there on the outside. And then after a few seconds, if they don't engage with you, then you move on to this next step, which is apology and explanation. And this is where you basically, you kind of break into the conversation and apologize by saying something like, hey guys, I'm sorry to interrupt. I haven't had a chance to meet you all yet. Just want to introduce myself real quick. So at this point, you're basically interrupting the conversation. And you're explaining why you're doing that. And then real quickly, you would want to move to introduce yourself. You know, if you're talking, if there are four people there, someone's going to be closest to you. You reach out your hand for a handshake to the person that's closest to you. Hey, I'm Michael Halper. At that point, they'll shake your hand, probably say their name. Now, here's where you kind of get a fork in the road. And this is where you want to determine, do I basically have everybody in the group looking at me and do I have like the complete attention of the group or do I only have the attention of the person I just shook hands with? So if complete attention is on you, you're going to proceed to the next step, which is what I refer to as a rolling introduction. But if the other people just kept talking and didn't notice what just happened and you, you're shaking hands with one person, of course, they're going to be looking at you. If you only have their attention, just focus on talking to that one person. And then you drill into that one conversation by saying, oh, OK, well, what do you do? And then at this point, you're maybe creating somewhat of like a broken off conversation with one person. And then you've broken into a new conversation and the process is done. If all four people are sitting there staring at you, you don't want to just then start talking to one person. You have everybody's attention. And so this is where you do what I call a rolling introduction. You just basically go around the circle, exchanging a handshake with every person and saying your name. You're shaking hands and you're not asking any questions around what do you do because you kind of have everybody's attention. So you don't want to be rude to the other people by talking to one person. So you kind of work your way around the group. You reach a point also where you're going to then want to figure out, do you have everybody's, again, do you still have everybody's attention or do you just have maybe not the full attention of the group? If you have complete attention, then you could 
kind of talk to the group with your next question of, hey, what do you guys do? And you say this to the group. And at this point, I mean, of course, not everybody in the group is going to respond at the same time. Someone who's maybe in more dominant leadership role of the group might may answer someone who's closest to you or someone who you have more of the connection and eye contact with will answer you. But if you all, if you don't have complete attention for the group, you might want to look for like the person closest to you or who you have eye contact with. And then you would ask one person, what do you do? So again, that's the process for breaking into conversations. It's a bit overkill, but you know, and you might look at that and like think it's just too analytical for you that you're not a robot. That's fine, but it it is a step-by-step process and take from it what you can. All right, the next thing to talk about is the sales process. We've talked before about moving prospects through a sales process. Now we're going to talk about moving networking partners through a sales process. And the reality is, is that we can actually move them through the exact same process that we're, we move prospects through. So prospects, we move them through what we've introduced in a previous training module. And I'm going to review it a little bit here today. So if you haven't seen these sales process slides, I would encourage you to go back to another training module on managing the sales process for prospects. But we use a process called ICE and it's interaction, conversation, and explanation. And we can use the same exact process for networking partners uh, with some slight alterations. Now, so here's the process if we're dealing with prospects, right? So the interaction is the first time we're meeting them. We're not trying to sell the product. We're trying to sell the next step in the process, which is the conversation. The interaction in a lot of times it's a cold call or email, but the interaction is when you meet people at networking events also. So you're working a room, you introduce someone, you're talking to someone briefly. That's the interaction, the first step of the process. Now, again, the interaction, just like in a cold call, should only be a few minutes. It should also only be a few minutes at a networking event because you don't want to spend too much time talking to one person because your goal is to get into as many conversations as you can. So if you spend more than five minutes, maybe you're starting to waste time. You might increase the two to five minutes to five to 10 minutes when you're networking, but you can follow the same process. Your goal is not to determine if they are someone you can sell to, or if there's someone that you can work with long-term. Your goal is to determine, does it even make sense for us to keep talking? And so in the interaction step, you ask pain questions or current state questions. We can add here your networking questions to that process. So again, the same questions that you would ask, but you just can add those networking questions to the interaction step. And then once you you basically meet someone, you might say, then you might want to progress them to the conversation step, which could be meeting for coffee on another day. So what this might look like is you meet someone at a networking event, you learn about what they do, you share a little bit about what you do. This is a great conversation. I want to continue this. Let's get together for coffee next week, or let's have a phone appointment next week or whatever. That's moving them to the conversation. And the conversation is where you learn more about them and share more about you. And it can look very similar to what you do with a prospect. Prospect, although you could probably add those networking questions back in here as well. And then the next step in the process is the explanation. This is where you would explain to a prospect what you do in the form of a demonstration or proposal or whatnot. Now, you could actually use the explanation step for networking partners. Remember, we're not trying to sell our product to networking partners unless that networking partner appears to be someone that could be a customer and fit well with us. Then we might transition from treating them like a partner partner to a prospect. But you could also use the explanation step for networking partners. Let me show you what that looks like. It's a little different, but it's the exact same process and step. So if you meet with a prospect, you may say, hey, you know, you may determine that they it makes sense to show them a demonstration. Then you meet on another day to show them, a, let's say, a 60-minute online demonstration. Well, if you're with a networking partner and you determine, hey, let's work together. I know a lot of people that can benefit from what you sell and they're wanting to refer leads to you. And it would make sense to educate that networking partner on what you sell. So what that might look like is if they say, what does a good prospect look like for you? And they say that in the conversation step, then you could propose this. You could say, you know, I tell you, what? Why don't I show you a little bit about our system? That way you have an understanding and then you have a better idea of who to send us. And you can also show me more details about what you do. That way we can have a stronger net relationship and send leads to eat one another. And so what that might look like is you may actually do the exact same demonstration that you would do for prospects, but you actually show it to your networking partner. Or for another example, that might be, let's say you meet for coffee and you have a brochure that you normally show 
show to prospects and meeting with your networking partner and they're asking about what you sell and you could show them the same brochure. So that's moving on to the explanation step with your networking partner. Now, what can happen a lot of times, and I would tell you to avoid this, is a lot of times you can end up in an instant meeting where this is where you meet someone. We can end up in this situation with prospects, like when we're doing cold calling, where we end up on in a meeting on the cold call. We end up talking to someone on the phone for 15, 20 minutes, and that's what I call an instant meeting. You can end up in this exact same scenario when you're networking, where you meet someone at a networking event and you end up talking to them for 20 minutes. This is not good at all when you're networking. And the reason why is because the time at when you're networking is so valuable. If you're in a room of 100, 200 people and you're just bogging down, spending 20 minutes with one person, you're wasting extremely valuable time. Remember, the goal is to meet as many people as you can. So it's very understandable to do this. Even if you have a little anxiety about meeting new people, you get a little comfortable and just keep talking to one person. But I would tell you to avoid instant meetings when you're networking. And in fact, if you end up in a good conversation, maybe they're asking good questions. That's a great opportunity for you to close to move that networking partner to the next step, to the conversation step by saying something like, hey, you know, we're getting in a lot of good details here. I want to learn more about uh, what you do and, and whatnot. Why don't we pause here, make some new contacts. You should make some new contacts as well. Let me get your email address and let's get back together on another day. So what you did there is you basically avoid the instant meeting and you close for the next step. And then you're starting to build that relationship with that networking partner. You could also end up in an instant explanation where you meet for coffee, I already mentioned, and then and you're talking to them and they're asking a lot of questions about what you do. And then you show them and explain to them what you do. And that's an instant explanation. Nothing at all wrong with that. We're moving through this networking process, right? So we've met people at the networking event and there are some very key post event tasks that I would recommend. The first thing is, and the way I would do this, when I'm networking, I collect business cards from everybody that I meet. And the very next morning I'm at my desk and I have my stack of business cards right in front of my keyboard and I flip through through each one. And I pull up, try to find each person on LinkedIn. If I see them on LinkedIn, I'll invite to connect, make customize the invitation to say something like, hey, good to meet you at such and such an event. Let's connect here on LinkedIn. I add that person to my CRM. I want them to be a networking partner. I still add them to my CRM because I still might want to send them messages through my CRM or schedule follow-up tasks. You know, part of creating good networking relationships is checking in with people and communicating with people in the same way that you would communicate with prospects. So having a good process in my CRM for scheduling follow-up tasks and doing outreach is a good best practice. Then right after I do that, I send a follow-up email. Hey, good to meet you at this event. Let's stay in touch. Or I might close them in my follow-up email for the next step in the process, which is a closing for the conversation, meeting for coffee. And this is where I try to schedule the one-on-one. -on -one. Either I do that in the follow-up email or over the phone. Then I might add the contact to any appropriate email campaign. Again, to build good networking relationships, it's about staying fresh in their mind. One of the best ways to stay fresh in their mind is using some sort of email drip. Now, the optimum thing here to do would be to have an email campaign that basically stays in contact with them, but does not try to sell them on your product or your features. So it could be maybe be an informative email campaign. So what you design for that email campaign is a whole nother conversation, but getting some sort of automation there so that they don't forget about you is key to networking. And the point there is that you could meet someone, but in order for them to keep you in mind, uh, in order to remember you when they're talking to their network of people so they can send referrals to you and recommend you to them is staying fresh in their mind. An email campaign is one way to stay fresh in their mind. Another way to stay fresh in their mind is by posting content on social media where they may see you. For example, if you connect with them on LinkedIn and then you just post friendly or helpful content on LinkedIn that they might see, they're more likely to keep you in mind. All right, so that's pretty much it. Hopefully those are tips that will help you to be a better networker. Some key takeaways are first, start with trying to understand the people you meet when you're networking in order to be a better networker. Shift from picking fruit mindset to one of planting seeds. Look for partners instead of prospects. Use processes to get the most out of your networking processes in terms of getting the most out of the, the individual events. And then use your use some sort of process, sales process that you move your networking partners through. And that's pretty much it for today. The next training module is on prospecting on LinkedIn.